Good evening, everyone. It's quite a new experience for me and uh, quite an honour, I should say, to be standing here talking to you instead of sitting where you are, where I've sat many times. And I think I should point out, just in case it's not obvious, that I'm no wiser or more qualified than I was prior to last year's election when I sat there. If on September the 6th, the day before the federal election, you didn't think I knew better than you how to spend your money or how to live your life or what to do with your own body, then you shouldn't think I know now. And it won't change when I'm sworn in either. Indeed, I recommend you remember that about all politicians. Many, have, uh, many of them have enough trouble keeping their own lives on track and are in no position to manage the lives of others. We are each the best person to manage our own lives. I'll return to that theme in a moment, but first let's, uh, let me say how much I agree with Bob. Very often Bob and I don't even need to discuss something to be in agreement. In fact, uh, Bob and I have an agreement to agree with each other. <laughs> Some of you might have picked that, that up already if you watched the 7.30 show recently. And unlike the pub senators who are only united by Clive's funding, Bob and I share the same values. That makes us a mini voting block. In fact, I might give the media here tomorrow's story. When Bob parted company with the Liberals, I think it was 2006, uh, that's a guess, but I think that uh, about when it happened, we tried to recruit him into the Liberal Democrats. He chose Family First instead, and we've now gotten over that. And we, we just simply look forward to the day when the rest of his party is like Bob. Uh, <laughs> We have agreed to defer to each other in some cases. On IR, for example, my approach will be to simply say, whatever Bob thinks is OK, it's OK with me as well. He feels the same about agricultural issues, an area that I know well. His hero is, in fact, Bert Kelly, as you mentioned, who is a farmer politician. Our views on housing are the same. It's a problem of over-regulation, and the solution is for much less regulation. But he knows far more about that than I do, so well, again, I will defer to him on that. But Bob and I do have somewhat different expectations about what we will be able to achieve as senators. Bob believes we will be able to make a real difference in terms of legislative outcomes. I hope he's right, but my expectations are much lower. I have every intention of using my vote to try and make a difference. I will use argument, reason, pleading, and occasionally blackmail. <laughs> but realistically, I expect my contribution will be greater outside the Senate. I see my election as a small beginning on a long journey, and it will, re will require a lot more people like me and Bob in the Senate before we really change things. That's my overall priority. I am, in every sense, a libertarian or classical liberal. As far as I can see, they are the same thing with the word libertarian being necessary because the American left hijacked the word liberal. I firmly believe we have inherent rights that do not originate with the government. I prefer the perspective of John Locke over Thomas Hobbes. I wholeheartedly agree with the view of John Stuart Mill that unless you're harming somebody else, it's not the government's business. Unlike a lot of people, I don't draw the line anywhere. Many times I've heard people say they support my party's policies with the exception of just maybe one or two things. Quite often one of them is firearms, and they more or less agree the government should have all the guns and the rest of us have none. They base that view on a dislike of guns. And to many people, that's all that matters. Once you dislike something, that's the end of the argument. It may be that this sort of thinking is where I will be able to make my biggest, uh, biggest difference. What I want is for Australians to reconsider the notion that to disapprove of something to not particularly like something justifies it being prohibited or heavily regulated. I want them to join the dots between one freedom and another, between their freedom and the freedom of others. I want them to understand that freedom is universal, precious and must be fought for. We currently hear gays insisting on their rights but who would quickly ban smoking and firearms. We have smokers who insist their rights are being denied but think McDonald's should be regulated. We have shooters who insist their right to own firearms should be respected, but would happily deny free speech to those who don't agree with them. My aim over the next six years is to encourage Australians to understand there is a vast difference between tolerance and approval. That approval is a matter of opinion, which we all have, but lack of tolerance 
is what leads to, for, to calls for the government to do something, to regulate and to tax. That's what needs to change. Consistent with that, I want to introduce people to the notion of governments doing less, of not only not doing something, but of doing less than is being done currently. There are plenty of examples of that, and I can't predict, predict which ones will resonate most, uh, but I and my team will press many buttons in the hope of finding some that will work. We'll push for doing less on nanny state stuff and into plain packaging, lower tobacco taxes, fewer smoking rules <coughs> excuse me, affecting private property, stop funding public health advocates who want to control what we eat, stop funding the environmental organisations that, that oppose everything about modern society, stop the green and nanny state bureaucrats who have infil infiltrated so many areas of the public service and make life difficult for entrepreneurs and innovators. I also intend to press buttons on health and education. There is no justification for the government being a service provider in these things. The government has a role to, de to determine policy, set standards, monitor quality and inform the public. It does not need to own schools or hospitals or to employ teachers, doctors or nurses. Service providers, whether they are profit, for profit, charitable or community, can do the job better than public servants. So long as there is a safety net for those who are seriously out of, out of luck, the government should get out of it. Doing less means lowering taxes, as Bob mentioned, so we can take more responsibility for our own lives, including saving for our health costs, education and retirement. So I see my role as primarily one of communication. If I can convince enough people to agree with me, we will win more seats in the Senate and our, our ideas can be implemented more widely. But as you know, there are people determined to prevent that. They belong to the Liberal Party, the Labor Party and the Greens Party. Representatives from these recently issued a report, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, that took a look at Senate voting. As Adam Smith put it, people of the same trade seldom get together, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public. Politics must clearly be a trade because the report is the worst collusion you are ever likely to come across. It starts with the assumption that the election of six minor party senators at the election is a problem and needs fixing. They especially point to the election of Ricky Muir in Victoria. The fact is, as Bob mentioned, about a quarter of the Australian public voted for someone else other than Labor, the Liberals or Greens. And the presence of minor, uh, dozens of minor parties shows, shows that these three parties are not addressing their concerns. There would be no need for a hemp party, a drug law reform party, a sex party, a secular party, an outdoor recreation party, a smokers' rights party, an animal justice party, a motoring enthusiast party, a bullet train party, a voluntary euthanasia party, or many of the other single issue parties, if the Liberals, Labor and Greens were considered to properly represent their concerns. And there would be no, no need for a Liberal Democratic Party if the Liberal Party was actually a Liberal, instead of being a tax and spend Conservative Party. The argument that the election of Ricky Muir proves the system needs fixing is ridiculous. Sure, not many people voted for him, and in fact he wouldn't have even been elected if we, Liberal Democrats, had submitted our preference um, tickets on time. But, but that doesn't mean... That means we stuffed up, not the system. He is from a minor party, a quarter of the public prefers minor parties, and he's only got one vote anyway. Now the recommendations of that Joint Standing Committee are intended to prevent that ever happening again. They pro propose optional preferential above the line and the abolition of group voting tickets. Hypocritically, they don't mention op optional preferential voting in the House of Reps or optional voting per se. Only optional preferential of above the line for the Senate. Now, optional preferential voting for the Legislative Council in New South Wales has largely wiped out the minor parties. Only the fact that there are 21 seats to be filled gives minor parties a chance of winning the last one or two seats. With just seat, six seats to fill in the Senate, there's no chance a minor party could win a seat. But not only is it undemocratic, it's also not in the interests of either the Liberals or Labor. If that system that they recommended was implemented, it would lock the Senate vote into a 3-2-1 split in every election. Neither the Liberals nor Labor would ever win a majority and, 
Labor would be locked in a permanent embrace with the Greens. The only winners would be the Greens. Lee Rhiannon, their representative on the committee, outsmarted the others. I think she's as cunning as a rat with a gold tooth. They, they want to prevent me from being the registered officer of both the LDP and the Outdoor Recreation Party. Seriously, how many people voted based on that? I could have made my wife or a colleague the registered officer. What difference would it have made? But it made sense to me and to my colleagues in the LDP to do both as I do most of the work. I'm supposedly gaming the system. I've scored two editorials in The Australian so far where I got mentioned by name for gaming the system. Frankly, I don't think those who, know, who use that term know what gaming means or how the system works. They want to make it more difficult to register parties and they want to prevent parties from nominating candidates who are not located in the state. This will mean fewer parties, but it won't do anything for democracy. There, are, there were no parties in the election which weren't serious about their values. And small parties don't have electable candidates in every state, including the Liberal Democrats. I have a four-word response to all these proposals. Over my dead body. To paraphrase a particularly vindictive speech by Scott Ludlam that some of you may have seen, I say to the committee, take your anti-democratic, collusive, devious proposals and shove them up your hypocritical gerrymander. I know there is one thing I will be voting, using my vote from the Senate for, and that is to maintain whatever semblances of democracy we will retain. Thank you for coming to hear me and Bob.